even to dead animals. The young artist is said to have been Rembrandt. After three years of concentrated work, Descartes prepared to send the manuscript of his treatise on the universe to Father Mersenne for publication in Paris. Then, like a bolt from the blue, fantastic news arrived from Rome. Galileo had been charged with heresy, brought before the Inquisition, and forced to swear that he abjured, cursed, and detested his scientific works. Most specifically, this referred to his belief in Copernicus's theory that the earth moved around the sun. Descartes immediately asked his friend Beekman for a copy of Galileo's work, and found to his dismay that many of Galileo's conclusions were identical to his own. Without a word to anyone, Descartes put away his treatise on the universe and turned his thoughts to less controversial matters. The work was not published until years after Descartes' death, and then only in part. Descartes' life was riven by dichotomies. He longed for peace and solitude, yet his loneliness drove him to obsessive travel. As a daringly original thinker, he vowed to follow my thoughts wherever they might lead. Yet as a man, he swore to obey the laws of my country, adhere to the religion of my fathers, and follow the example of the wisest men I meet. He was convinced that what he had written in his treatise on the universe was correct, yet he also firmly believed in the God of the Church. Descartes has been accused of cowardice, of being a secret atheist, and of not even knowing himself despite all his introspective meditations. None of these accusations stand. Descartes may not have been of the stuff of martyrs, but that doesn't make him a coward. He was convinced that without dropping any of its scholastic tenets, the Church could still come round to his point of view, and his intellectual self-knowledge was deeper than that of any philosopher since Socrates, even if it did contain a few psychological blind spots. Yet the greatest dichotomy that beset Descartes lay in his philosophy. Descartes saw the world as consisting of two kinds of substance, mind and matter. Mind was unextended and indivisible. Matter was extended and divisible, and obeyed the laws of physics. This meant that our incorporeal mind was lodged in a mechanistic body. But how could the mind, which had no extension, interact with a body which could only obey the mechanistic laws of science? Descartes never satisfactorily solved this problem, which so uncannily echoes the psychological dichotomies that beset him in daily life. Yet he did try to produce an answer. According to Descartes, the mind and the body interact in the pineal gland, an obscure organ near the base of the brain, whose precise function remains uncertain to this day. Unfortunately, Descartes rather missed the point here. The question was not so much where they interact, but how. A rare human element now enters Descartes' life. He has an affair with a girl named Hélène, who may have been one of his servants. As a result, he has a daughter whom he calls Francine. After the birth of Francine, Hélène lives with her daughter in a nearby house, but visits him regularly. When others are present, Descartes passes off Francine as his niece. From these few facts, it is difficult to know for certain what kind of relationship he had with Hélène, but it's easy enough to conjecture. Poor Hélène! What did she make of this upper-class cold fish with the emotional range of a filleted cod? What did she register when she gazed into those shadow-ringed, abstracted eyes of his? Hélène may not have been able to break through to Descartes, but Francine certainly did. Guilelessly she reached out to him, and he responded. It wasn't so much that he'd been rejected in his childhood. There was just no one there, except old Nanny with her potato love. Despite attempting to pass Francine off as his niece, Descartes soon grew to love his little daughter, and she offered him a unique emotional experience in his life. He was now writing what is today considered his most original work, his Discourse on Method. Ironically, the body of this book consisted of safer portions lifted from his treatise on the universe. These contained ideas that were to change the face of mathematics and make several revolutionary advances in science. In this work, Descartes laid the foundations of modern analytic geometry and introduced coordinates, later to be named Cartesian coordinates by Leibniz. 
In optics, he proposed the law of diffraction, and put forward an explanation of the rainbow. And he attempted a rational scientific theory to explain the weather, which, like our present theories, ended up only working retrospectively. But far and away the most important part of the discourse on method is the comparatively brief introduction. This outlines the thinking that was to change the course of philosophy, and in an even more revolutionary departure from tradition, Descartes makes these ideas both comprehensible and readable. How is it possible to convey profoundly original philosophical insights with sufficient clarity so that anyone can understand them? This problem has defeated most of the great minds of philosophy. Plato cracked it by setting out his philosophy in the form of dinner-party conversations. Nietzsche thought he'd cracked it by writing the most brilliant, subtle, and powerful prose ever penned in German, but his megalomania turned into pure mania. Wittgenstein attempted to circumvent the problem by allowing for the attention span of the TV age, and writing brilliant two-line remarks but he refused to back them up with philosophic argument. Descartes succeeded in overcoming this problem by the simplest and most obvious method of all. In clear, autobiographical prose, he describes how he goes about his thinking, and the thoughts that occur to him in the process. When you read Descartes, you experience what it is like to be a great mind thinking original philosophy, and he describes this so deceptively well that you think it's easy. It appears no different from the way you might think. Step by rational step, you follow him to his conclusion. Descartes begins by taking the reader back to snow-covered Bavaria and the time of his vision. Winter set in, and I found myself in a spot where there was no society of any interest. At the time I was unworried by any cares or passions, so I took to spending my day in a stove where I could be alone with my thoughts. In surprisingly cool prose he then goes on to describe how it is possible, by means of persistent and determined doubt, for us to destroy our belief in the entire fabric of the world around us. Nothing remains certain. The whole universe, our very individuality, even our own existence, may all be a dream. We have no way of knowing anything for certain, except for one thing. No matter how deluded I may be in my thoughts about myself and the world, there is just one thing that is undeniable. I am thinking. This alone proves to me my existence. In the most famous remark in philosophy, Descartes concludes, Cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. Having established his one ultimate certainty, Descartes proceeds to rebuild upon this foundation all that he has doubted. The world, the truths of mathematics, the snowbound Bavarian winter, all return with cold certainty, chastened by their period of banishment to the never-never land of doubt, but more indubitable than ever now that they are built on such an indubitable foundation. Having had the courage to doubt the entire universe, Descartes typically chose to publish his work anonymously. He also published it in French, in the hope of reaching a wider audience. He wished to avoid controversy with the Church, and hoped to do so by appealing to people who were interested in the new sciences. Astonishingly, this almost worked. Almost. People soon determined the author of Discourse on Method, but at first they were more interested in its mathematical and scientific theories. Descartes revolutionized the field of optics by discovering the law of refraction, but his advances in geometry were even more revolutionary. Here he introduced the notion of coordinates, to this day known as Cartesian coordinates after him. These enabled the identification of a fixed point by reference to a horizontal and a vertical plane. He also introduced algebra to solve geometric problems, thus founding analytic geometry. Mathematicians were fascinated, then outraged. For most of us, the one certain thing about mathematics is that it's either correct or incorrect. Such a naive approach immediately disqualifies one from the realm of true mathematicians. Having read Descartes' new mathematical theories and recognized their profound originality, all the great mathematicians of the era were soon gunning for him. Gassendi, Pascal, Insen, Fermat, one by one they entered the fray. 
Such controversies are well beyond the comprehension of mere mortals. Those who believe otherwise may find the old story of Fermat's last theorem instructive. According to this, there are no whole numbers above two, such that the following